receive data, and allow ground controllers to talk with space shuttle crews in orbit. Now, after years of continuous service to more than a dozen missions, NASA's tracking and data relay satellite, Tedris-1, is retiring. And liftoff, liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space shuttle. We have a go for deploy. Launched with Shuttle Challenger on the Orbiter's maiden voyage in 1983, Tedris-1 replaced NASA's reliance upon a system of ground-based stations having limited global coverage with 24-7 global space communications capabilities. When Tedris went up, it was for the shuttle, and so the shuttle was really the first mission to use it. And so uh, eventually then we had uh, Earth science uh, missions and space science missions, and obviously I think the most famous is what we do with Hubble today uh, that uses uh, the Tedris spacecraft to relay all its marvelous pictures of the heavens. Among other successes, Tedris-1 was the first satellite used to support launches from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida in the early 1990s and it relayed the first phone call between the South and North Pole. When Tidris became uh, a daily service for the National Science Foundation team at the South Pole, they uh, set up their day around when Tidris uh, F1 was available, normally about uh, five to six hours a day, so that they could do their emails, send files, rec you know, receive information, communicate with, uh, you know, with their families and loved ones. So it was... For them, it was an absolute game changer. And literally, the South Pole Station's lifeline. During a highly publicized medical emergency there in 1999, U.S. doctors used Tedris 1's high-speed connectivity to assist weather-stranded scientist Jerry Nielsen through her own breast biopsy. Tedris 1 arrived at its final destination, about 22,500 miles above the Earth on June 13th, and will be shut down this week to begin the updating of NASA's Tedris suite of eight satellites. Saying goodbye to a, uh, to, to a, to a friend who has uh, served, you know, served uh, the nation well, uh, but uh, there will be more friends that will come along when we launch the next generation of Tedris spacecraft. Three, two, one, launch, launch, launch. Stop. The replica Orion crew module used in the highly successful launch abort system Pad Abort 1 flight test in New Mexico May 6th has returned to the Dryden Flight Research Center. The crew module and its separation ring were airlifted back to Dryden from Holloman Air Force Base near the White Sands Missile Range test site. Dryden engineers and technicians will spend several months inspecting the module and all of its systems for possible use in another abort flight test. The Glenn Research Center, Plum Brook Station, and the Marshall Space Flight Center welcomed members of the STS-131 crew to share highlights from their recent 15-day mission to the International Space Station. In April, the seven-member crew aboard Shuttle Discovery ferried to the complex a number of projects overseen by Glenn and Marshall, including four space experiments designed, fabricated, tested, and managed by Glenn and a multi-purpose logistics module containing the Window Observational Research Facility, or WAR, an Earth Science Observatory rack under Marshall's charge. We get the honor and the privilege of going to fly in space, but without the thousands and thousands of people here and around the country working on a space shuttle program, uh, it would not be uh, a success like it is today. Commander so Alan Poindexter led the STS-131 mission and Jim Dutton served as the pilot. Mission specialists were Rick Mastracchio, Clay Anderson, Dottie metcalf Lindenberg, Stephanie Wilson, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Naoko Yamazaki. STS-131 was the 33rd space shuttle mission to the ISS. While soccer fans around the world watch and await the winner of the 2010 World Cup, student players from the U.S. and Canada heard scientists and engineers from the Ames Research Center's Fluid Dynamics Laboratory explain the aerodynamics of the Jabulani soccer ball. Specially designed for this year's tournament, the Jabulani, which means celebration in Zulu, has come under criticism from World Cup goalkeepers who claim the ball can be unpredictable in flight. During a special presentation, professional soccer player Stephen Bideshaw of the San Jose Earthquakes 
helped a NASA physicist identify the reason for the ball's flightiness, an aerodynamic principle called the knuckle. You can see here, just from the trail, how the ball changes direction as it's flying away, away from us. And that's what the knuckling effect is. And with the smoother balls, that critical speed at which this knuckling occurs is increased. And that's why you're seeing more of it. The event was part of a NASA Long Distance Learning Network webcast. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.